Well, good morning, my farmer friends. It's Corinna from MyDigitalFarmer.com and Shared Legacy Farms out in Toledo, Ohio. For all of you new folks who are new to our community, I wanna say a special hi to all of you. Every week I show up inside this Facebook group and do a live training on a particular topic. And usually it revolves around marketing for farmers. But today I'm actually gonna be talking about a different type of topic, which is field to table dinners or farm to table dinners, whatever you call them. Um, I'm gonna walk you through a pretty detailed workshop um, detailing how I go about planning one of these because I'm actually working on this right now. It's the beginning of April and this is the time of year when I begin to put some of those elements in place, plan them out, start making contacts. I've had some people reach out to me in the last few months here and there and ask me for advice on how to put together a field to table dinner. And because this is something that I have done quite a bit, I just naturally have a lot of experience here. And I thought, you know what, maybe I'll talk about this in one of my trainings for my farmers. So that's what we're talking about today. I am gonna warn you, I keep trying to make these trainings shorter because I know that you guys don't wanna sit in front of a video camera and, and watch for 40 minutes. And I swear to you, I am so working on this, but this particular topic, when I was putting all the notes together, there's a lot of stuff. And I just felt like, you know what? They're gonna to have to just give me a break one more time. I want you to look at this as like a workshop that you might attend at a conference where you wanna learn how to put together a great field to table dinner because I'm gonna give you tons and tons of details, really tons of like a checklist almost of the things you need to think about. So we have done a uh, field to table dinner every year since the inception of our farm in 2008 for our CSA members specifically. We've done all permutations of it. We've done field to table dinners on the farm itself. We've actually done um, some that are in restaurants that we, uh, that we have a relationship with and we still call them farm to table dinners. We've had giant ones with like over a hundred people. We've had really small ones with only eight people around a table. Uh, so there's many different ways to go about it. And I'm gonna walk you through a, what, what I would call my checklist. This is the checklist that I use when I start the process of planning a field to table dinner. I usually do one to two a year. This year I am doing two. So I don't have a fancy commercial kitchen at my farm. I don't have a stove out in the packing shed or any heating units. All I have is a giant walk-in cooler. I have two of those. I have a utility sink um, and I really don't have a major parking lot either. So I have been able to make this work. So let me kind of walk you through this. Now I have made plenty of mistakes. I'm gonna encourage you to stick around to the very end where I share with you um, the mistakes that we have made. We make, seem to make one every single year and I think that's gonna actually be a valuable part of the training because you are going to be surprised at the kinds of things that actually kind of make a big deal. Now, field to table dinners are a lot of work. I'm gonna be really upfront and honest about that. Um, and that's the reason why I only do one to two a year. A one big one and one really small one. The small one's really easy to put together. Um, but when they are done well, they are a game changer. They are a gold mine for your branding. And what they do is they end up really pulling in your ideal customers, your core customers, your super users, and turning them into brand ambassadors. When they have a chance to come out to the farm and spend several hours with you in the fields, together eating a meal, breaking bread over a table, something happens mystical in that transaction that makes them suddenly feel like this is my farm. I just had a meal with my farmer. I believe in this place. There's like a mental shift that happens. So I really feel like even though they're a lot of work, they're definitely, definitely worth it because it builds that connection with your members. Now, bottom line is your customers will love them, especially if they're priced right and well executed. They really have the potential to build a sense of community and they create a memory for your customers, a powerful memory of your farm. So they only have like, you know, a certain few number of snapshots experiences with you and that becomes a very powerful one. So just keep that in mind. Now I'm going to put a link 
in the comments later of this Google Doc that I am using to basically my notes so that you can just copy that and or down, you know, look at it. I won't let you edit it. It'll be a view only, but that way you can just have this checklist at your disposal. So you don't really have to be taking notes right now. You can just grab that later. Okay. So let's dive into the checklist of the things that I think about and I tried to put them in kind of in an order, okay? So the first two I think are the most important things that you really, I want you to picture like a flow chart, you know, where you have to, you get asked a question and you either go yes or you go no and you, you know, follow a different path. I feel like these first two ones are pretty key moments in the flow chart that are gonna really dis determine some of the other elements later. So first of all, you need to decide on the purpose of your dinner or the target audience of your dinner, so who are you really trying to serve? And there are many different ways you can look at this. Um, as a CSA farm, I really feel like the farm to table dinner should first and foremost be for my CSA tribe, and that I should offer it to them first before I offer it to anyone else. And that's just my choice, but this is something you're going to have to think about. So is this like a thank you? Is this an end of year celebration? Or is this something that you do on the front end as sort of a welcome and a way to kind of open up the doors and open house kind of thing and build, start to build that relationship? Um, do you wanna to showcase your actual farm? Because then that's gonna determine whether or not your event happens at your farm or whether you're okay with having it happen in another location. Are you trying to feature your product? Do you wanna make sure that all your stuff that you're growing is in that meal or are you okay with other things being featured? Maybe you wanna feature some of your partnerships. Maybe you have a really strong relationship with some big time chefs and you wanna accentuate that for your branding. Um, so just those are some things to think about in this section. Who is your target audience? What's your purpose? Also, is this going to be a fundraiser? So the one that we're doing this year, in the past we've always just done it as, as a money maker for us. But this year we're turning our big event into a fundraiser for the local charity, the local food banks. And so that's really shifting how we go about planning it, the kinds of relationships and vendors that we're seeking out. Um, and then do you need to make money, all right? Is this something where you need to make a lot of money or is this event more of a branding thing, a service, like a value add, an opportunity to build relationships? Um, so kind of know what your motivation, your goals, your target audience are. That's really, really important to set on the front end. The second thing on my checklist is also, I think, really important to determine early on. What will your role be as the farmer? Because here's the truth. I've done so many different versions of this. Um, there have been uh, field to table dinners where I have called up a restaurant, one of my chefs, basically a caterer, and I said, I would really like to do a farm to table dinner and I don't wanna have to do any work. I want it to be all where you just show up, you take care of ordering the, you know, the tent if we need one, getting the tables here and the, the chairs and all the details. Like I just wanna be able to show up the day of the event and shake people's hands and walk around and schmooze nothing else like i'm okay with cleaning up my farm the day of a little bit but i don't want to be responsible for anything else except selling it and so that is an option that you can if you decide that early on that makes things a whole lot easier you won't get as much money out of it but that is an option and that may be what you want to do the first year if you really just want to be hands off then just go with a caterer find someone who's going to come out and set the whole thing up for you look at it as like a wedding you know that you're planning a wedding on your farm and you hire someone to come and take care of all the details for you um you could also be like in the thick of it where you are a core part of the planning team and you essentially organize all the pieces and and i have done that as well where i have done it all that is really really exhausting i have also this year i have a team of csa members that i've invited because it's a fundraiser i have a couple of really powerhouse women who are well connected in my community and the three of us are putting this together and we're having team meetings and we're talking through all the logistics. So just decide what's your role gonna be as the organizer or are you just gonna be like delegating it to someone else, okay? That's important. The third kind of thing on the checklist is how big do you want this dinner to be? That's also um, gonna make a lot of difference in future decisions down the roll here uh, on your checklist. So. You, how many people are you serving? That's gonna be one of the first questions that your chef will ask. And frankly, it may determine whether or not they want to work with you. Because think about it, if you're only gonna be able to give them 
20 guests uh, and, and you want them to come on a Saturday, well, they're gonna decide between your 20 guests at you know $80 a person versus doing a wedding or a bigger party where they're gonna make more money and they may end up choosing another vendor because, or another person, another customer because they're just gonna make more money. So you wanna be thinking about how many customers can I, can I promise this chef? How many people am I gonna to try to serve? So we have done uh, like dinners of like 30 to 40 where it's been in a restaurant itself, kind of like in their space and we've taken over, you know, one of their big rooms. Um, we've done a hundred people at the farm where we have a big time chef come out and run it all. Um, but we've also, last year and the year before that, we had private, very intimate private dinners with one of our high, high end chefs. I think he's like probably the number one or number two chef in Toledo, happens to buy our product and really likes us and he loves to come out to our farm. It's like his Sabbath. He gets so much out of it. He takes, you know, the whole day, comes out here and just picks stuff as he goes and gets creative. It's sort of his opportunity to be creative in, you know, in mother nature. And so he um, basically organizes a, a dinner for eight people and it's $150 a person and people show up. We have a small intimate gathering with the farmers. So just imagine if there's eight guests, they are getting really close contact with a farmer, three hours of our undivided attention. Plus the high end chef of Toledo is like three feet away, having conversations with them the whole time, showing them how to cook, having, you know, uh, wine with them. And it just creates this really cool experience. And at that price point, and because the chef gets something personally out of coming here, the chef is willing to come and do that. So that is a smaller event, but it really goes a long way because we can build strong connections with those eight people that show up. Okay, so how big do you want it to be? You have to make that decision ultimately. Number four is the location. You have to decide where are we gonna have this. So we often think, oh, field to table. Well, obviously we're gonna have it at my farm. Not necessarily. Um, you can also have it at a restaurant or another location. Um, that's maybe perhaps closer to your target audience where they live. And the, the point of farm to table is that you're featuring the stuff from your farm. Um, so we've done that several times with great success uh, and people still come to those. They still enjoy those, especially if it's with a chef that you have a relationship with. Um, but if you're gonna have it at your farm, um, get as specific as where will we have it on my farm? Like what, what would the location be? Think about when the sun goes down, will the sun be in their eyes? Where are they gonna be sitting? Um, is it shady in this location? Is it right next to the compost pile? <laughs> um, is it in the middle of this glorious field? Um, or how close is it to the cooking location? Because people are gonna have to travel to carry these plates and it's gonna, the, the plates are gonna get cold in the process. So you need to kind of be close to, to a general cooking location. Are you gonna have it covered? You know, so these are some of the things you have to think about. We um, typically like to have it out in the open and then we have sort of a backup plan because we have some high tunnels in, this, in the fall that can be pushed forward over some open land and we can always put people in underneath cover if it were to rain. So we kind of think that through, like where's the location that we wanna have it. One of the other things that I really value is having my customers have a chance to actually walk the fields and do a self-guided tour. And so I wanna make sure that wherever we stage this, that that, that location is not so far away that they're gonna, you know, it's gonna be 10 minutes from where we actually have dinner, okay? So um, the fifth thing on the checklist, let's keep moving, is when. When are you going to have this to schedule the date? This probably should be a little bit higher up on the list. Here's the thing, when you're working with chefs, you really need to schedule well in advance. You cannot call them two months before. You wanna have this dinner and expect them to have an opening, especially if they're a really good chef. They're going to be booked. And if they're a caterer, they may be booked a year in advance, depending on who you wanna ask. So you've gotta be mindful of that. They fill up fast. And Friday, Saturday, Sunday nights are kind of, you know, obviously the options, but you, you have to sort of think about when are you available? So I know for us, we don't like Friday nights because that's when we're getting ready to go to market and doing all the harvesting. It's just crazy. It doesn't fit our workflow. Saturdays, we've done Saturdays, but again, Kurt doesn't come back from the farmer's market until pretty late in the afternoon, and it just makes for a hectic setup process on our part. Um, so we actually really like Sundays, and our chefs like Sundays because they often take that day off, and so that becomes a good day. 
So you just have to kind of feel that one out and just test it. But think about what time of year you want to do this as well. So uh, think about what do your fields look like? What does your farm look like? If you're showcasing the farm, um, that's just something to be aware of. I know my husband's always very sensitive to what, is my, what does it look like? Like, is it covered in weeds? <laughs> do we want to try to have it earlier on? And he's always cleaning up the place in the, the week before the event so that it looks nicer. Um, but also just temperature. Think, thinking about things like temperature, how hot is it going to be? Thinking about daylight, uh, when does it start to get dark? Um, so we typically do our big one um, in September just because we have learned the hard way that July is just too hot. It's uncomfortable. Our guests are not comfortable because we don't have a climate controlled space and the sun is just hot, you know, high in the heavens still. It doesn't get dark early. It is just hot and it's uncomfortable for everyone. So um, we typically have them in the fall and it sort of feels like a celebration of our season, a goodbye, a thank you moment. Um, to kind of cap off the year. And so that, that's why we've always typically put them near the end. But we also feel like that's when we have a lot of products that we can feature in our menu. Um, there's just more options than if we tried to have it in June. Okay, so that's number five, figuring out the when. Okay, number six is deciding on your style and what I would call your format of your dinner. So uh, this is where you want to imagine like how does the night flow or, or the afternoon if you have it in the afternoon is this a five course meal is this a, a tapas menu you know where it's just a bunch of mini plates and portion sizes i know that chef nixon um, does that for us he will have like 12 to 14 courses sometimes so you feel like you're getting a lot of food they're really small but honestly by course 10 i'm usually like no more i'm so full um, so there's just different styles of doing it and the perception can kind of change if a customer is getting, you know, course after course after course, they feel like, wow, I'm really getting value. Um, but some people might like the more traditional, larger portions of the five course meal. So you have to kind of decide on that format and then you're going to choose your chef based on that because some chefs prefer certain formats over others. Sometimes you also have to think about, is this going to be a laid back kind of thing or is it going to be more formal? So are you going to do like a pig roast where it's just a little bit more laid back or like a barbecue style thing? Or, or will you have it fancy with fine china and this feels like you're in um, a four or five star restaurant in town, it's just out in the fields, all right? Do you want it to be sit down and served to you in stages? You could also do stations, which is what we're going to do uh, this year for our field to table, we'll still have tables where people sit, but they're going to have to get up and go to the stations and fill up their, um, their course themselves and then come back. So that's going to help us just with like menu or wait staff issues since it's a fundraiser event. Um, or you could also do family style. I've been to farm to table dinners where um, they bring a huge platter and then the table of eight passes that around and shares. So those are kind of the three options that are out there and you can basically tell your, you know, you and your caterer or your chef, talk about those options and figure out which one you think works best. They each have their pros and cons. Okay, number seven, this is where you wanna set your price point. Now, this is an important discussion to have with your caterer or your chef because um, this will sort of determine whether or not they want to work with you. And frankly, um, it kind of helps you decide if you wanna work with them. So in the past, Chef Nixon is you know, one of the top chefs in the, in the industry in Toledo. And when you go to his restaurant and you have his chef tasting in his restaurant, you are paying $150 for that service. So um, he in some ways can't come to my farm and offer it for less because that is already sort of the price point that, that he has elevated himself to. And anything lower than that would, would feel strange for him. So, and people know that about him. People know that he's a high chef. So they kind of expect that when they know that he's the guy being featured on the menu. Um, so I can come to him and I can say, okay, this is our price point, put a meal together. But um, I have a whole bunch of people in my CSA who can't afford that. That's way too expensive. That really only hits a subset of users. And in the last couple of years, I've noticed that people are missing that lower dollar entry experience. They don't need to have all the bells and whistles. They don't need to have, you know, the, the, wine serve, the wine pairings or whatever. So we 
kind of are coming to this particular event and we're saying, okay, however we organize this, we want the price point to be around 60 to 70 bucks a person because that's a much more accessible, accessible price. And the reason we can say that is because back in step one of this checklist, I set a goal that, you know, my target audience is my CSA customer and I want to reach everyone. Like I don't want it to just be this elite thing anymore. I want it to be a real celebration of our farm where everyone can have um, access to this experience of being out on the farm and being eating our meal in a fancy kind of in a fancy environment. So um, your price that you set will kind of determine the type of customer that is attracted to the offer. Um, and if it's a low ticket price, it's going to give you experience to more people. If it's a high ticket price, you, you'll have, you will have people who will buy. You have to trust me on that. When, when I remember the first time the chef Nixon was like, you got to charge a hundred and actually it was 175 the first year. And I almost like choked. I'm like, I cannot ask people to spend that. And he's like, I just trust me. And so I did, and I sold out in 10 minutes. I, there were eight seats, but I sold them in 10 minutes. I was stunned. There are a, like a subset of super buyers within your tribe who will actually pay that much money. Um, but you can't, I don't think you can just have those kinds of meals. You really have to have um, dinners that are at a more accessible price point. So having both of those dinners in the rotation is maybe a good strategy for you. So just being clear with the chef on how much, um, you want the budget to kind of be to see if they're willing to do that. And then they kind of move their, you know, magic numbers around and try to make it work. You'll have to think about is alcohol included in that price? And then how many tickets do we need to sell to make it worth it for both parties? So here's where I want to talk about um, money. Like what can you expect? So typically uh, across the board over the what 10 years that we've done this, on average, our cut has been about 20% and 80% goes to the chef. So I just want you to think about that. Um, one of the questions that farmers ask me is this like a, a money, you know, does this make a money? And I, I actually don't think the field to table dinners make a lot of money for us. We might pull in like a thousand, 1200 bucks a year as income for them from the farm dinners, which, you know, we're a 400 member CSA. So um, if you're looking to start field to table dinners as a, you know, a ton of adding a ton of money to your pocket, um, I, I really, some of you can weigh in and say it's different for you, but I have found it to be the opposite. We don't really make a lot in terms of income, but we do get a big return on the satisfaction of the customer, building retention, building those relationships. So that is sort of the compensation piece that we get and instead and the experience of it all is really valuable to the customer and I see it as like a service to them. So um, how many tickets do you need to sell to make it worth it for you, for the work you're gonna put in and for the chef? And when are you gonna pay the chef? So you need to have that conversation. Are you donating the produce or is that part of the cost that you're gonna get back? So those are all just kind of questions to think about as you set that price point. Okay, number eight on the checklist, is it going to include alcohol? So uh, this really depends on, there's two ways you can do this. If your restaurant, your chef has a liquor license, like Chef Nixon does, he can come in and serve it at our farm. Um, and so he brings a full bar and we just build the cost of the unlimited wine into the price of the ticket. Um, and there's also wine pairings with each of the courses that he serves. Um, and we even build in the tips. So I just don't even want my customers to have to worry about tipping the server. That's all taken care of in the price. But another option that you can do if your vendor or your caterer doesn't have the ability, doesn't have a liquor license and can't do that, you can also say bring your own, um, your own alcohol. And that could just be your, your kind of in the invitation and people know that, that they have to bring their own glasses and their own wine. And we've done that. We did that our first year and that, was, that worked really well. Um, so I do, uh, I do get really mindful though about, uh, people getting drunk. And so we have, we say that in several different places. We talk about it in the email when we first remind people to come out and give directions. We just remind them to be safe and to make plans for having a designated driver. We bring it up right before we eat the meal, when we kind of bless the meal. And we talk about it at the end when we say goodbye. So we're also just watching, Kurt and I, we're just watching as people say goodbye to us. Who is there anybody that's under the influence? And we're just mindful of it. So um, just know you'll, you'll have to be, keep your eye on that. Also, what time is last call? So that's something to think about as well. When, is, when is, do we cut off the taps? Okay, number nine. 
we're finally getting to choosing your chef. And I wrote down, choose your chef or your caterer wisely, okay? So the secret, so when I talked to my, to Chef Nixon, we talk about how, how he does these dinners so well. We've had a mix of different kinds of chefs come out and try to do these for us. And Chef Nixon is really the one who has risen to the top. And that's the reason why we continue to ask him back again and again, because the stress level is so much lower. Things just don't seem to go wrong. Like the food is always good and it's warm and it's the timing is all right. Um, so I feel like you really wanna try and choose someone with experience. And when I asked him like, what's your secret sauce? Like, why are you so good at this? And he told me, well, the secret to successful meal planning is actually pre-cooking for this kind of event. And he's like, is it for a chef is to just pre-cook a lot of the stuff. You know, so he still is cooking stuff there on a grill and he's got like a, you know, an induction, I don't know if it's an induction grill, heater, something that's cooking with induction. So he's doing some cooking there and he's plating everything, but some of the stuff has been pickled or taken, you know, taken care of way in advance so that there isn't as much for him and his staff to do when he's actually there. Um, so somebody who has experience, who knows how to do this, who can do it to a crowd, if you have a hundred people, there's a big difference between serving 100 people and 25 people, which we learned the hard way one year. So um, just ask what kind of experience they have. And some of these restaurants, if they're caterers, like if they do weddings, they're good at this. They know how to do this. They go off site and do this all the time. And you can feel a lot more confident about working with them. Um, ask for recommendations of other people or you know, say, hey, do you have someone I can talk to that can be like a referral and I can ask them how you did? They're happy to do that. Um, sometimes I also look at the chef as someone who can help me sell tickets. So, you know, Chef Nixon is the, the top chef in Toledo, one of the top chefs. And so when someone hears their name, a foodie in my CSA hears his name, they know who he is and they all want to, they want him to be their private chef for that dinner. And so it's much easier to sell tickets for that. And in, in fact, I've even had him put the tickets on his Facebook page and say, Hey, I've got this private dinner. Um, I've got two tickets left and they sell out in like five seconds, you know, so you can use their, their relationships and their list to help you find more people. Um, let's see. Another option is to do a collaborative event, which is actually what we're doing this year. We're not just having one chef. We're, um, we're trying to get like four chefs that we work with and they're each going to be in charge of one to two courses. And so if that is the case, then you've got to kind of play point guard and be you know, really in communication with them, but that is also an option. You don't have to just go with one. Then they only have one kind of area that they're really in charge of. But we tend to use chefs that we already have a relationship with that buy our produce. Um, and so we have done multiple dinners where each one is featured, but we've also done collaborative ones where they're working together. Okay. Number 10, this is where you start thinking about some details. I'm just gonna quickly list them off. I'm not gonna go into crazy detail. Do you need a tent? If not, just have a rain plan. We used a tent one year, that's it. Out of the 10 years, the rest of the time, we have just rolled the dice and we have you know, this, this uh, backup greenhouse that we can put people in. And we did actually have to do that one of those other nine years when it rained. Um, chairs and tables. Uh, you have to rent them. Sometimes the caterer will take care of that. Or in our case, Chef Nixon has enough in his restaurant. He just brings them along with him. So we didn't even have to worry about that. Decorations. Are you going to spend some money on that? Or are you going to get creative? And is your chef going to do that? Or are you going to do that? Um, we've used just local farm flowers and produce from our farm on like a black tablecloth, like squashes and, and just flowers that they found out along our bike path. So you can do that at a very low price point. Um, cutlery, glassware, tableware, are you gonna rent that? And this is where you really lean on your chef and your caterer. He knows where to get the good deals for that and that will often be included in their price. Um, lighting, pay attention to lighting because it does get dark depending on what time of year you do it. Uh, you'll have to be thinking about what are we eating at this point in the course? <laughs> do we need to have light or can it be starting to get shadowy and dark? Um, when's, you know, what's the cutoff time when we have to be done? So we actually have a string of lights, electric Edison bulbs that we purchased and we mount them on these simple wooden posts that get pounded into the ground. And they're two long strings that go down the length of the long tables. And that's what we have. So they get turned on at the right time of night. Um, we also have done it where we've wrapped them around inside of the high tunnels so that there's light there when we need it. And we also build a bonfire or a campfire, I should say, 
at the evening time when people are starting to begin to think about leaving so that there's just that ambient light going on then. Um, is this a weather dependent event or are you having it thick or thin, through thick or thin? Bathrooms, you gotta think about bathrooms and that's gotta be built into your expense. So two porta potties, uh, two to three porta potties were fine for us. Uh, for our hundred guests and we usually set up a little makeshift sink right next to them as well um, Just make sure you clean them before the guests arrive. That was a mistake we made too um, Parking think about parking. So I don't know what your what your farm looks like We have a super quarter mile long driveway so people just park along the driveway and that we can manage a hundred guests that way um, but if you don't have parking, maybe you need to find a nearby field or you need to find a, a business nearby that you can park there and then you have to figure out a shuttle system. And then music. So I have not always had music at my events, but I feel like when I have had it, it has added some extra pizzazz. Um, so just what kind of feel are you looking for? Is this like a banjo thing or are you looking for, you know, a guitar that's just mellow? Uh, and when will they play? When will they not play? You just sort of have to kind of figure that out. So you don't need to have music, like our intimate dinners with the chef with eight people. We don't have music playing. Okay, those are some of the big details when you, just when you're planning an event. Number 11 uh, on the checklist is creating a budget. So at some point you actually have to look at all these different expenses that you've just sort of kind of figured out and say, okay, <laughs> Um, can I, what's this all gonna cost me? And work that out with the chef and together you're gonna figure out how much am I actually going to take home? Um, you don't want to go into debt. Well, you don't want to have your expenses be greater than your income. So this may be where you change your price point and make it a little bit higher so that you can account for that. Okay. <clears throat> Number 12, create a detailed event schedule in Excel um, or if it has to be on a clipboard. This is, this is where you like outline the night. And what I want you to do is just walk through a sample dining experience from beginning to the end. So picture it in your mind. A person pulls in, they, they see your sign uh, off the road, they turn, what happens next? Is there a sign saying welcome to the field to table dinner or is there not? Um, is there directions so they know where to park? Is there a parking attendant waving them and welcoming them? Okay, so you're just, you're really trying to think through what's the ideal process step by step. So um, I actually recommend going to another farm's field to table dinner if you can and just experiencing one and getting ideas and, and just thinking through what are some of the things that, that were in place so that this felt like a seamless event. You really want to see yourself as you plan this event as a guide and you are telling, it's like you're laying stones in the creek for your customers. Um, this is where I want you to go next and now here and now here there should be zero confusion in the mind of your guest as to what happens next because that's what creates anxiety for them. So let me just like buzz through an example of what this event schedule might look like. Okay, so um, a greeter greets them, shows them where to park. Kurt and Corinna, that's myself, the farmers are staged at a little booth when they arrive to welcome guests as they appear and we take turns, he and I, um, walking them back, take their tickets and walk them back to uh, the area where the actual dining event is held. And as we do that, um, I am giving them kind of an orientation. I'm showing them where the bathrooms are. I'm walking them through how the night's gonna flow. When appetizers start, how they can get a cocktail right now. I take them to the bar. I ask a few icebreaker questions and I let them know when the formal dinner sit down will begin and when we plan to end, okay? So I just give them enough information that they're gonna need for, to get through the next 15 minutes, okay? And then I come back, meanwhile, my husband is doing the same thing. The band starts to play at 6 p.m. Um, the bar is open at such and such time. Guests help themselves. They find a seat at 6.30. We ring the bell to announce um, people to come in. People have a chance to walk around the fields and do a self-guided tour. Um, appetizers are passed around by wait staff who are roaming the fields with different things on trays starting at 6.10, that goes till 6.30. Do you see what I'm doing? Like I'm just sort of imagining the flow, like how much time will each course take? Um, we welcome them after the bell's rung and they sit down. Um, we know that takes about 10 minutes to get everyone in their seat. We welcome them, we say grace, we do some vision cast language, we introduce our chef, we remind them to drink responsibly, no need to tip, et cetera, et cetera. Then the first course comes, second course, and we usually have time, like timestamps, so that the chef knows like, hey, 
You need to be done with the last course by this time. Because I have guests who have babysitters at home, like, and, and if they don't get home by this time and it goes really late, that's awkward for them. So we really try to run on a tight schedule. We, um, uh, we always have a bonfire or a campfire to kind of close out the evening. I'll talk about why in a minute. Um, but so there's a time listed on the schedule, like somebody's in charge of getting that started at such and such time so that it's blazing by such and such time. We begin our thank yous at this time with the dessert course, then the coffee bar is open. Goodbyes are said starting at this time. Um, and then we have like a goodie bag that we give to our customers. Um, our chef prepares some kind of uh, final treat that they can take home. And then that's sort of a, a good final last impression. And we let them linger and then they drive away and wait staff starts to clean up at a certain time. So you're just kind of outlining all of these things. I hope that was a good example of the kinds of things you would think about. All right, so that's a part of the process because whether you're the event planner or someone else is, you both wanna be on the same page. Like I wanna know <laughs> that the caterer or somebody has thought about this stuff, that they're not just flying you know, blind and just kind of going with the flow. I've done that before and that didn't work out so well. Okay, the next tip is that you wanna make sure that you actually have your chef or your caterer come out to your place and see the lay of the land. It's super important. It should not be the first time that they ever see the space when they come out for the farm to table dinner that night, okay? So you wanna talk through the schedule with them. You wanna talk through things like flow, make sure that your expectations are the same. You can talk about some of the mistakes that have happened in years past and how you really don't want that to happen again because that just, those that really helps the chef, how many servers they're gonna need to get stuff to everyone, um, how will they keep the food warm, just what, what your goals are. Your chef wants to know what your goals are. I remember um, Chef Nixon was, was expecting me to, uh, one of the years, to like actually help bring dishes to the different tables so that I could meet and greet and talk with the guests. And I was like, that's, that's a really cool idea, Chris, but I actually just really want to enjoy the meal this time. I want to sit down and I don't want to feel like I'm working when we're actually eating. So he was like, oh, okay. And so we made some different changes in how the, the night flowed. Um, okay, for, someone asked me about marketing. <clears throat> how do you market these events? So we pre-sell all of our tickets, obviously in advance. And I usually initially limit the number to create a sense of urgency. So if I know that I'm gonna have potentially 125 tickets, I'll only sell like 85 or 95. That's what I'll promote. And um, that creates this sense of, oh my gosh, they're going so fast. And then I will generously open additional seats and let some more people in. So that's kind of a little strategy that I have used. Um, I sell them on, uh, sometimes I sell them on Square, sometimes I just do it um, over email so that I don't you know, have to give away that big percentage. When you have a $150 dinner, um, that's a big chunk of money that's going to the fees. And it kind of depends. Um, but I always market it to my CSA members via email first. I'll put it in the newsletter. We'll talk about it in our face, private Facebook group. It'll go out in an email. I'll tell them when it's ready. And I usually get a big rush. I kind of do like a build up, like a launch. So I'll start talking about it before I open the doors, um, maybe three or four days before, so that I have people primed and ready and they're just like waiting at 8 a.m. when I finally open the doors and open the cart and they're in there and they're like, they grab it, okay? So uh, because I want to do this event to celebrate my CSA, I target them first. And usually I sell out pretty quickly to that audience. So they don't even need to take it anywhere else. But if I do need to offer it to other people, then I email them the rest of my list like a week later. And um, usually the rest of the spots fill in then. You can also post something on Facebook or let your local chef that's working with you promote it on their pages as well. Okay, safety and liability. Um, is also something you need to have on your radar. Um, I am not a lawyer, so I would just advise you in general to kind of ask this question of your insurance agent. Um, I do have, we have a liability insurance policy, and we actually brought up this with our insurance agent when we first got insurance that we wanted to have these kind of events, and we walked through like what was allowed, what wasn't allowed under the liability insurance policy. And so that is, something that you should definitely think about. Now your chef will also have that kind of liability insurance as well. Um, so there's kind of two different entities, but you wanna be thinking about safety stuff. So what identifying what some of the risks are um, for an event like this, 
Um, so I think about alcohol, people getting you know drunk and leaving my my party drunk. I think about like footing, like losing their footing and hurting themselves. So we kind of sweep the scene and look at places where could someone trip and fall. Where do we need lighting so that people can see where they're walking, especially in the evenings. Um, and then as far as food safety, that's a really big one. But we really lean on the chefs to provide help there. So they. Um, they know the things that they need to do. If they're setting up stuff in the packing shed, they, they have the right kinds of tables that they bring with them, they, you know, or they have coverings for the ones that we have that are get, getting sanitized. And they, they know all the rules of the road there. So I don't, lean, I don't even propose to understand all that. I just trust on them. Okay, so that's all I'm gonna say about safety and liability. Um, seven, number 16, this is embarrassing that there are 16 things on this checklist, but there are, here we go, setup. So let's talk about setup. Um, setting up for the event will take like at least half a day. You're going to feel like you spent a lot of your day putting this event together. It's going to be a distraction. So if you are, you know, farming, trying to earn a living, doing the things that farmers do, um, you've, you've just got to be mindful that this is going, if it's a big event, especially, it's going to take some of your attention away and you need to plan for that. Don't be like, oh, well, I'll have a couple hours to kind of clean stuff up. Really give yourself more than that. So our chef usually arrives by like 11 a.m. to noon, the day of, if we have a meal starting at six. And so, you know, there's someone present. They start asking questions. Where can I find this? Where can I get this? Hey, can you set up a table here? You know, and it just interrupts your day and your flow. And so you just have to be available or someone on your team needs to be available to, to just be that person and answer those questions for the chef. I know there's always something that they forget. Like one year they're like, oh, we don't have any ice. Can somebody go get bags of ice? I'm like, okay, I'll go get bags of ice. Or there was one year um, that the band guy came and we didn't have the right electrical stuff there and so we had to make stuff up. So you just gotta be ready to drop everything and and move. So the day, the day before and the day of, my husband is usually frantically running around trying to clean up the place so it doesn't look so messy, making room so that there's flow in places where crowds can move. Um, so just know, don't plan anything major for that day, okay? Um, communicate, communicate, communicate is, is like my, my next tip. And you need to take the initiative with this. And when I, you're communicating with two different people here, with your chef and then with your guests. And we'll talk about the guests in just a moment. Chefs are not good. As a general rule, they are not good at communicating with farmers. I have, or maybe it's the other way around. Maybe we're not good at communicating. I don't know. Um, but I just find that I really have to be intentional about following up and asking questions. I can't rely on the caterer to get back to me with every little thing, keep me posted. And I am a little bit of a control freak, like I wanna know that these things are being thought through. So I'm just bugging the chef. I'm not feeling bad about it. I'm texting him, hey, da 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 da, or I'm worried about this, or have you done this? So just be mindful that I don't think chefs are always that good at that, so you're gonna have to take the lead and provide that for that. Especially if you have multiple chefs working on the event like we do this year. Um, you will be the point guard. You're gonna have to delegate what their course is well in advance, keep them posted, let them know what stuff is out in your fields so that they're gonna be able to use, get it to them, um, et cetera. Um, I usually try to have them set the menu a week, at least a week in advance, if not two weeks, so that I can send it to my guests. Okay, communicating with your guests. So there are a few things that I have written down here on the checklist. So first of all, just at the front end, like when you're making the offer in the first place, who gets asked first? I believe it should be your core customers, uh, your, either, either your CSA members. If you don't have a CSA, then you know your buyers. Um, before you open it to the public. And the email confirmation is the receipt. I have also actually printed tickets before, but then you gotta mail that out. I don't know if that's necessary. Um, then there is like a follow-up email sequence that drips out with a few pieces of content, keeping them informed of some key milestones as they get ready. So um, there's one where I send it out, I broadcast it, like here's the, gonna be the menu for the night so that they can see it. And if they have any problems with something on the menu, I'm like, you need to tell us that now. Um, I also just remind them that the event is happening, okay? Um, the next email will be about a week before and it says, it's kind of the, the big email with all the content in it. It will talk about what to wear. So, hey, if it's gonna be chilly, wear a wrapper. I'll be like, don't wear your finest clothes and high heels. This is a farm. 
um, or maybe you want them to dress fancy, you give them guidance on what kind of attire is appropriate. Uh, this is where you share directions. You're gonna tell them what time to arrive and roughly when, you know, what those first 15 minutes look like so they can kind of decide, do I wanna show up and, and you know, feel awkward? Because your introverts might not show up until it's actually time to sit down because they don't wanna have to walk around and make small talk with people, all right? So you just wanna let them know what that first, you know, 15 to 30 minutes will look like what time you think things will be over, where parking will be and where to park, um, if there have been any menu changes, again, the dietary restriction piece, like, hey, last call, you better let me know now, um, and then your phone number, your cell phone number, in case something happens or they get lost, uh, they can reach out to you. Um, I also remind them of the plan for, hey, if there's bad weather, here's what will happen. And then consider doing a reminder call. If you don't have tons and tons of people, um, this really helps the no-show rate a ton because there are people, believe it or not, who forget and then you always feel bad because you're like, man, you spent a lot of money. So I feel like it's a good courtesy to actually do a quick reminder call. I promise you, like 80% of those calls are just messages. So you don't have to, you know, you don't get bogged down in these long conversations. But that just prevents no-shows and I just have a little script that I follow and say, hey, if you have any questions, I do some quick, you know, big bullet point reminders in that message as well. Um, I'm coming to the end. Okay, we've got two more. Uh, number 19, greeting your guests and playing the host. So you should have a plan for saying hello for the touch points, the beginning, the bookends of the, of the experience, for the beginning of the meal and the end of the meal. And, and you should sort of know what your role is and what you're going to do. I really look at myself as the host and the hostess of this meal. And so we have a plan for how we're gonna greet everyone on the front end. Um, we take them to the eating area, we give them instructions and an orientation. And my husband and I have a strategy about where we will sit, okay? So this is not something that I thought about on my first field to table dinner. All of a sudden it was time to sit down and I was play, you know, in this awkward position of like, oh crap, who do I sit with, right? Like, and you feel this pressure because everyone wants to sit with you. Like you are the celebrity of the dinner, you and the chef. And so where you sit, people notice and people at that table feel special. And so this is why I try to make a point of being strategic about not always sitting with my friends, the same people every year, um, but I also get up throughout the meal and I just go kind of like at a wedding, the bride and groom, they go and just say hello to people and touch, touch base at all of the meals or at all the tables. And, and so we do do that. Kurt and I divide and conquer the space and make sure that every table gets a moment where they have like a minute or two of our attention. Um, we have a welcome moment before the meal. We have a thank you moment at the end of the meal where um, we just kind of let people know this is the final course. We thank the chef. But then we also make a point to tell everyone to come and say goodbye to us before they leave because we have a gift for them that we wanna give them. And that just makes sure that they all have that moment with us where we can sincerely thank them for coming and just sort of read their body language if they had a good experience or not, okay? Um, so uh, that's the whole part of being the hostess with the mostess and you gotta embrace that role and do it well, okay? Finally, engineer the epilogue is number 20, engineer the epilogue. So I sort of hinted at this in my last, in number 19, step number 19, but um, how you end your event is important. We didn't always uh, engineer our endings very well. And so uh, there was one year where the final course was delivered. We didn't really have a, a goodbye moment and there wasn't coffee delivered that year for some reason. We didn't have coffee, duh. Okay, and so everyone's sort of waiting for that cue, like when is it time to go? And so that's why we have learned that we need to engineer the epilogue. We need to have certain triggers that happen that are identifiers to everyone that, oh, we're coming to the end. And not like a hard and fast end, like okay, we did this trigger fire, it's time to go. But you have like several mini triggers that happen that sort of warm people up. They're like, oh, this is the first call, right? <laughs> like. I can linger another 15 minutes. Oh, and then another call comes and it's like, oh, I might wanna start you know, thinking about getting ready to go and find my wife out in the fields or whatever, right? And then another like trigger, it's like, all right, we should, we should go now. People are starting to leave, it's time to go. So just like think through what will some of those 
markers be because you can position them. Um, so here's some examples. You can have the wait staff start cleaning up the tables. All right, that is a major clue that we are beginning to end the evening. Okay, and I wouldn't recommend doing that first, but that's an example of a trigger that happens. You could have a campfire that's going and um, the coffee and maybe even some of your desserts are now moved over there. So there's a transition. You provide a space for people to go and linger so that they leave the table. Do you see how that becomes a precursor, like step one of we're beginning to move to the end of the night? Okay, you have a last call announcement for wine or beer or whatever. Again, that's another trigger like, hey, we're coming to the end. So just think about what do, what, do those things, what do those things look like? Or you can do a final call like, don't forget to come and grab your goodie bag, okay? And then when people start to see bodies moving out, it sort of becomes like a herd mentality and everyone sort of begins to leave. So um, just explain, uh, explain to the chef like what your drop, you know, dead time is. You want people out of here by such and such time and they can really help sort of negotiate that as well. All right, before I let you go, I hope this has been helpful. If it has, give me a thumbs up or something as I feel like I'm speaking to, to a vacuum. Um, the final section, I just wanted to go through mistakes that we made because um, every year it seems like something goes wrong and every single one of them is a learning experience. So I wanna, I wanna just highlight some of them for you because I feel like this is probably some serious gold right now. Just make a checklist here of like, oh, I need to make sure that we have some things in place that, that don't let this happen. Okay, they were all perfectly legitimate reasons for why the mistakes happen, but if you know them in advance, you can plan for them. Okay, in no particular order, the one that came to mind first was the year where um, the food was not cooked enough. So the chef was working on a grill, a new grill, one of our grills he wasn't familiar with. He had never really cooked outside, he'd always, done um, his stuff in his own restaurant. He didn't have a lot of experience cooking for 40 people on this type of grill. And so it was taking longer than he expected for stuff to get cooked through. And so we're waiting awkwardly for the next course. It was like 20 minutes, we're still waiting for the next course. And finally he just started serving it because it was starting to get dark. And some of the people um, got raw, like pretty raw fish. So um, that's just a conversation to have. Now we know that we, we don't put that chef in this outside of his comfort zone. We go to his restaurant when we're gonna do a field to table dinner. And we also know to have that conversation with other future chefs like, hey, bring your own equipment that you're familiar with. Or we're like, hey, there's wind here, okay? <laughs> so you need to be mindful that cook time might be slower and build that into your timing. Okay, another thing, this was, this was also really awkward, not enough food. So we were still hungry at the end of the meal. That happened on year one. And let me tell you, there's nothing worse than having people spend 80 bucks for a meal and feel like I didn't get enough, okay? So that was a huge conversation that we had as we processed afterwards um, with the chef. And then moving forward with future chefs, we're like, okay, let me be very clear with you about what a portion size is like. And I tell them, I want them to feel full by the final course. So whatever you have to do, if you have to charge me extra, I want them to feel abundance, okay? Um, slow service between courses. So um, this was partly because the chef only brought, this was for a dinner of like um, 30 people underneath the packing shed area. And he only brought, one, I think he had one or two wait staff that were serving all those people and they just couldn't keep up like between trying to give us wine pairings and, and serving clear dishes and put new ones in front of us. It was just taking really long. So um, the problem, the pain point there was that the chef did not bring enough wait staff. He was trying to cut costs and just didn't bring enough servers. And so we just talk about that, like how many servers do you need per person? Um, how far are the servers having to walk to get to the table to serve because that's also time lost in the process. So we have those conversations. Um, eating in the dark, we once ate in the dark. That was that same meal where it took him really long. The food wasn't cooked all the way through. So we had people 
it was you know 9 20 and we were still waiting for our i think third or fourth course it was like really it was very awkward and we had um luckily these were core customers and so they were cool but we did have one couple that had to leave because they had a babysitter and they had expected it to be over by 9 9 30 and so they didn't get their whole meal and i just i actually gave them some money back at the end because i felt really bad about that um too hot we did our our one of our meals in july it was sweltering it was uncomfortable never again um flies we had one year where the flies were bad and that's probably because we were staged right near like our um, tomatoes were kind of back there in the package there was there were flies there were flies and we just i felt like i was constantly doing this and they were all over and i was just like oh so you know think about bugs think about gnats time of year kind of stuff um no coffee one year i just can't even actually that happened two years one year we didn't even think to have coffee and the second year we had the coffee but they didn't brew it oh i was so mad so coffee for me is important because um, it's for me it's one of the triggers that lets a person know we're coming to the end of the experience and it's an expectation of people when they go to eat have a fine meal they're going to be offered coffee at the end so i just felt like that was a major like whoops and so just you know you got to have all of those touch points the people were waiting for the final cue and it never came and then i had to walk around and be like there isn't going to be coffee tonight. I don't know. It was just it was just strange for me. Okay, this one's kind of funny. You don't think about this until it happens. We had three porta potties, but it got late because it was in um, mid to late September when we had this meal, um, and there was no light in the porta potties. Okay, so I found out that customers were using the flashlight on their iPhones so that they could see what they were doing in the porta potties, okay? I was mortified, mortified. Luckily, it didn't fall into the toilet. But uh, the next year, we made sure that we had lights inside of each of the porta potties. They were just little like um, light sticks that when you push a button and they're, they just, they're on and they can hang from somewhere. So we just had those in there permanently. Uh, we made sure they were turned on at a certain time so that there was light, okay? Things you have to think about. Um, okay, and then this was just some planning stuff. Uh, not, not having good communication with our a caterer one year where they assumed that we were taking care of a certain element of the project, of the setup. And remember, I told you that there were a few years where I was very clear, where like, I don't want to do anything. You're doing everything. I just want to show up at 6 p.m. and greet guests and you know play the part of the host. Well, it was like two hours, two hours before the event and they're like, they, had, they didn't have lighting. And I was like, where's the lighting? It's gonna get dark. And they're like, oh, I thought you were taking care of that. And I was like, no. So they actually had lights that she was able to pull out of her stock, but we didn't have poles. So that's when my husband had to run to Lowe's, find these giant poles and stakes, get out there with a, you know, a huge ladder, pound them into the ground, he's sweating like crazy, even figure out how to hang these lights. He was so angry because <laughs> he was doing other stuff. Um, and now we still have those poles. That's how we got the poles. We still use them every year. Um, but that was just a moment of crazy stress because we had 15 minutes before guests were going to begin to arrive. My husband hasn't showered yet. It just, it was not fun. Um, and then I think another mistake that we made is that we made, we had a, a year where all we offered were the really, really expensive $150 ticket meals with, with Chef Nixon. Those, we had just a bunch of private dinners. And I feel like looking back that that was a mistake. We didn't have another type of meal, a lower price point meal um, offered at all. And, and that made some of our customers feel like there was a little elitism going on, like, oh, you're only doing it for the expensive people now. Um, I just got that vibe. And so that, that's why this year one of my goals was we got we to gotta make sure we're serving everyone, that we give everyone this opportunity to have an experience out here. Um, equal accessibility for all. Doesn't mean we can't have that super expensive product line, but we also have to have something else in our product suite for people who don't want to spend that much money. Okay, um, those are the big mistakes that we've made. Um, and I feel like, but I want to end with, um, what do I like about farm dinners and what do I not like so much? So top of, top of mind comes things that I love, the energy that it brings to my brand and to my community, especially when we do it at the end of the season. 
it's just like I feel like you ride a wave like a wave just swells during those two three hours on your farm and you just feel this goodwill and like happiness and satisfaction from your customers and it's such a great way to tie up the season and end on a good note so for me that is why I love it just seeing everyone so excited about the relationship they have with us I also as a foodie I just love to eat the food itself so I'm always excited about sitting down and having a fancy meal that I didn't have to pay for this time um, and just the chance to connect with my customers what I don't like about them and I'm gonna be really honest I'm a control freak I'm very type A um, and you can't control everything there's always something that goes wrong and so whether it's the weather that gets too hot or somebody's you know the sun is in our eyes and we didn't anticipate that or the flies or oh my food's cold or gosh they didn't do the coffee like it just seems like there's always something and then I get all tense like oh no someone's expectations aren't going to be met what if they don't like it and and just managing those expectations that causes anxiety in me so it's hard for me in the moment itself of the event to actually really let go and enjoy it because even if someone else is in charge of it I still feel like I'm just trying to make sure everyone's happy and if I sense that someone's you know upset like there was one year that we didn't have soda and she was you know a recovering alcoholic and so she was just mad that we didn't all we had was alcohol and water and I was I just felt really bad I'm like oh geez okay you know and, and, and I just personalized that it was one person but you know that's the kind of stuff that weighs on you in the middle of the event um, and then just the setup I really hate the day of setting it up um, just I feel like that whole day it's just all about cleaning up the farm um, these little minute details so I'll be I'll be honest the setup and cleanup part is my least favorite um, but that's what I wanted to end with so hey that's all I've got I'm gonna remind you that all of these notes are going to be available um, as a Google Doc in the comments so that you can just uh, take a look and print them off and use them for when you plan your future field to table dinner I want to encourage you if you're doing it for the first time to number one go see one in action to get some ideas and number two start small start with a small group of people don't make your mission to make money off of it just try to break even and learn from that experience kind of learn the ropes and test things out uh, that is probably the best thing you can do the first time you go at this hey thanks for joining me if you liked this video give me a thumbs up or um, share shoot a comment to me I'd appreciate that and if you're watching this on YouTube later for the first time please subscribe hit the bell and you'll be notified of other future trainings thanks for joining me guys I'll see you next week for another marketing minute makeover. Bye guys.